In the course of our study of the character of God on Sunday mornings, we come this morning to the theme of the love of God, and there are two main places in the Scripture to which I want to invite you to turn with me in your Bible. The first is in the Old Testament, in the book of the prophet Hosea, who, of course, in a very special sense, is the prophet who not only taught and wrote about God's love, but was brought by God to feel the nature of his love. And then in the New Testament, in the passage we read in 1 John uh, chapter 4. One of the difficulties of our approach to the subject of the love of God is that we can so readily imagine that here at least we are on familiar ground When we turn, for example, to a theme like the holiness of God, we may feel that it is something somewhat outside of our ken. The sovereignty of God leaves us in the realm of mystery. And there are so many areas in God's character where we feel ourselves on unfamiliar ground. But it's very easy for us when we come to study a theme like the love of God to feel, well now, I am more comfortable with this idea. It's something that I grasp and understand much more readily. And that, of course, is precisely where we are wrong. Because in scriptural terms, the deepest mystery about the Godhead... The greatest wonder that attaches to the character of God is not about his immensity or eternity or omnipotence or sovereignty or holiness. It focuses and concentrates on the deepest and greatest mystery of all, which is in the love of God. And if there is one place where man is not on familiar ground when he begins to explore the character of God, it is when he comes to try to understand the love of God. That is why, of course, the Apostle John, in the third chapter of his letter, from which we did not read this morning, he has been called, you will remember, the Apostle of Love. He cries out at the beginning of chapter 3, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us. We began our worship with a paraphrase of that this morning. Behold, the amazing gift of love the Father has bestowed on us, the sinful sons of men, to call us sons of God. And John is expressing, he is almost exploding, as someone has said with a sense of astonishment and wonder, grappling with the unknown when he begins to ponder the love of God that has made us the children of God. Quite literally the phrase means, from what country is this love? It's the same word that's used in Matthew 8, 27, when the disciples fall back in astonishment and say, what manner of man is this? that even the winds and the waves obey him. From what world has he come? This is a new dimension that we are experiencing. This is another realm from the one in which we live. And what John is saying here in 1 John 3 at the beginning is that there is something here that has broken in from another realm for which we have no true parallel. It is not something that we ourselves are familiar with. It belongs to a foreign land and another realm than our own. And he is amazed and bemused by the mystery of it. Now I find this very interesting because when a man has begun even to grasp a little of the real nature of God's love. It is not a complacency that he understands it well that fills his soul. It is a sense of bewildered wonder, astonishment that comes out in the very language of some of the hymns that we sing about the love of God. Amazing love! How can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? Love so amazing, so divine. That is the language of the man who has begun to grasp something 
of the sheer surpassing mystery of the love of God. Now we often think that the time when this wonder is deepest and freshest is when it is all new to us, you know. We say in the new dawning of a day spiritually, this is when the sense of wonder fills our hearts and so Cowper sings in his hymn, where is the blessedness I knew when first I saw the Lord? When that fresh glory of the Savior's love dawned upon me, where is that? But the very interesting thing is that the John who writes this epistle is an elderly man. He's probably been a believer for something like 60 years. He's in his latter days towards the end of his life. And the really significant thing is that he has never got over the sheer wonder of the love of God. In his last days, he is still pondering from what country does this love come? From what realm is this love that has called us God's children? I am bound to say to you that if ever, if ever I am permitted to grow old, I long to grow old like that with a sense of the sheer growing glory of the love of God. John breathlessly cries, Who can grasp it? Now I want us to try to explore this theme even a little this morning and we shall be conscious that we are, as Amy Carmichael says, simply on the edges of his ways. All through this world that will be true. Not till then, says Robert Murray McShane, will I know what I owe. Not till then. And it is only when we see him in glory that we shall understand it in its fullness. But we have already begun to learn the first lesson that we need to learn about God's love, which is that it is infinite, not finite, not human and limited like human love is, but limitless, infinite love that belongs to another realm. Because God himself is infinite, his love is infinite. Now, what that means is not just that God's love is very great. What it really means is that God's love is inexhaustible, that it is never expended. Now, that is a great contrast with human love, but God's love is inexhaustible love. It is infinite from another realm in that sense. Now, this is precisely the lesson that Hosea the prophet was to learn in this most painful situation that he was brought into by God to be, in a sense, a living testimony to what the love of God reached down to. You know the story of Hosea, do you? Hosea was a prophet of God who was called to a very special kind of ministry. He was brought by God to marry a wife called Gomer, whom he loved and wooed and drew and brought to himself and wed and they became one. And God brought this wife to him and Gomer and Hosea were married. But by and by Gomer's love cooled and... Hosea discovered that there was a distance that was developing between them. And then he began to recognize that familiar pattern as she drifted further and further away from him and into the arms of others until the ultimate anguish of the day when Hosea went down and looked in the marketplace and there was Gomer vending her body in the marketplace publicly. And at that point, God speaks this word to him that we read in Hosea chapter 3. The Lord said to me, go again. Love a woman who is beloved of a paramour and is an adulteress. 
even as the Lord loves the people of Israel, though they turn to other gods. And Hosea discovered that day something of the infinity of the love of God, its inexhaustible nature, and his whole soul must have rebelled against it. Can you imagine? It was not a place he would even have gone to. It was the last place in the world that he would have expected to find the one on whom he had expended the love of his youth. But God says, go, go again, go again. For this is the love with which I have loved Israel, even though they have turned to other gods. Now you see, that is limitless inexhaustible love. The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. Could we with ink the oceans fill and where the skies of parchment made where every stalk on earth a quill and every man a scribe by trade to write the love of God above would drain the oceans dry nor could the scroll contain the whole though stretched from sky to sky God's love is inexhaustible unlimited love and not only the prophecy of Hosea which is the key to it but the whole history of God's people in the Old Testament scripture and that is the point of it is a testimony to this infinite inexhaustible endless limitless love how far will God go with them we find ourselves saying again and again and again here they are as it were spitting in his face Casting his law back in his teeth. Running after their own paramours. And we say how long in God's name can it go on? But you know that's not just the story of Israel. My dear friends that's your story. And my story And blessed be God this morning. His love is inexhaustible. But Hosea tells us not only that God's love is unlimited, but that it is undeserved, unmerited love. That is, it is love to sinners. God commends his love to us, says Paul in Romans 5, 8. God commends his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now, of course, love at the human level is so different from this, you see. Love at the human level is awakened by something in the object of its love. So we speak about people as being such lovable people. And there are, the world is, I was going to say full of them, at least peppered with them. People who are lovable people, delightful people who draw something out from you. You see that in human love, you see. There is something in the beloved that has drawn it out. Other people might not see it. What in the world did she see in him, they will say. But she sees something. There is something in him, in his character, nature, being that has drawn love out. And we are like that. Love is drawn out, it may be, by some quality, something we see in people. But the love of God is not only not like that, it is precisely the reverse of that. Because it is not only that we did not merit God's love, it is that we merited the opposite of God's love. It was while we were rebels, hostile, enemies of God, that he loved us in Christ. Do you know Deuteronomy 7, 
that great classic statement of the love of God. Deuteronomy 7, 6, listen to it. You are a people, holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his own possession out of all the peoples that are on the face of the earth. But it was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love upon you and chose you. You were the fewest of all peoples. Why then did God love you? It is because the Lord loves you. That is the only explanation. He loves you because he loves you. And there is no other motive than God's love himself. No other stimulus to the love of God except the heart of God. And what we receive from God is the very reverse of what we deserve from God. And that is the sense in which God's love takes on the character of grace. God's grace is his love freely poured out on the undeserving and the unmeriting who merit from God banishment and judgment. And he loves them so as to pour the riches of his goodness upon them. That is God's love, unmerited, undeserved. But Hosea tells us something else. God's love is unchanging as well as unlimited and unmerited. There is another way the Bible describes this. The Revised Standard Version translates it steadfast love. But it is really covenant love that God is speaking about. That means, of course, that God has entered into a covenant, a marriage covenant with his people. That's why Hosea is brought into this situation, you see. God is a covenant-making God. His love is the love of the great lover of our souls who seeks out a bride for himself. In the Old Testament it is Israel. In the New Testament it is his redeemed people. But God is the great lover of the universe. And he is going to and fro throughout history and throughout the world. Seeking a bride for himself. To wed them, to woo them, to bring them to himself. And to covenant forever that he will be faithful to them. So the Old Testament prophets speak. Who said the Old Testament spoke about God severely and the New Testament about God tenderly? The Old Testament prophets speak of the steadfast love of the Lord enduring forever. And God is that lover who says, I will allure you, I will bring you into the wilderness, I will draw you to myself, I will be your God, you will be my people, and he covenants with them. Now what that means, you see, is that God pledges himself and all that he is to his people. You know how they used to do and I think possibly still do in the Church of England, they endow their bride with all their worldly goods. For some of us that's a greater sacrifice than others, but it was something that I frequently heard people doing, with all my worldly goods I thee endow. Now what it means is that in the covenant pledge of marriage, everything that is mine is covenanted and pledged forever to you. And that originates with God's covenant, you see. The reason that people do that is that that is a shadow of what God does. He pledges all the riches of his grace to his people. All the glory of God's character is pledged to his people forever. In rich and poor days, in calm and disturbed days, in sickness and in health, in success and in failure. Now, my dear friends, we need to grasp this. 
you will know that when we sin and fail and fall and when we make mistakes and when we come to our lowest rather than our highest, we recognize that some people's love wanes. Isn't that true? You may have experienced that. Almost every human being experiences it because it's a human failing that our love is not unchanging. It changes with all sorts of things. But the fatal error is to project that human weakness onto our vision of God. For the scripture says it is a lie. And the steadfast love of the Lord is never changed by my sin even. If you grasp that. And this love, this covenant love, he has sealed in Christ's blood, which is the blood of the covenant. We seal human love with various symbols, but God seals his love with the blood of his only begotten son. Could you ever doubt it, therefore? But here is a fourth thing we learn from Hosea. God's love is not only unlimited and unchanging. God's love is redeeming love. To redeem in the Bible, of course, is to pay the price of taking someone out of their bondage and misery into freedom. That is what a redeemer does. He comes to pay the price of delivery for someone who is in bondage. And we read in Hosea 3, 2, The Lord said to me, Go again, love a woman who is beloved of a paramour and is an adulteress, even as the Lord loves the people of Israel, though they turn to other gods and love cakes of raisins. That's just a symbol for the material things. So I bought her. Have you grasped, have you grasped the sheer mystery of that? Here is Hosea with this bride who belonged to him but had sold herself. And he says, I bought her. He inquired of the price. And he bought her for 15 shekels of silver and a homer and a lethic of barley. Now that is redeeming love. And what the New Testament tells us is that the redeeming God has done the unthinkable. Hosea did what must have seemed to people like the unthinkable. But God, the Redeemer, has done the unthinkable. He has not only continued his love, he has not only come to where we were in our bondage, He has not spared his only son, but has delivered him up for us all. You are redeemed not with corruptible things like silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. Here in his love, says John, Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. So he has loved us with the kind of love that has not only chosen us and covenanted us, but at the cost of the blood of his only Son, he has redeemed us. But there is one other thing we need to learn from Hosea about God's love. It is unlimited It is unmerited, it is unchanging, it is redeeming love. Do you notice finally that it is jealous love? 
Hosea 3 verse 3. I said to her, this is Hosea walking back from the marketplace, hand in hand, no doubt with Gomer again. He had bought her to himself and he is walking back home from the market and he says to her, you must dwell as mine for many days. You shall not play the harlot or belong to another man. So will I also be to you. What is he saying? Well, he is saying that divine love is jealous love. Now, there are two kinds of jealousy. And only one of them is a vice. It's important for us to grasp this. The vicious jealousy is the jealousy which says... I want what you've got, and I hate you for having it when I don't. That's jealousy as a vice, the green-eyed monster, which causes so much distress. It's a kind of infantile resentment springing from covetousness. But there's another jealousy, which is a reflection of God's, actually, And that is a zeal to protect the exclusiveness of the marriage bond. And such jealousy is a virtue, not a vice. Because it shows a grasp of the true meaning of the marriage relationship. And this is God's jealousy. He will not have other paramours taking his place in the lives of his children. He will not allow them to go and spend their love on others. And Hosea becomes God's spokesman to Israel and to us for that when he says, you shall not belong to another. He wants a people for his exclusive possession. God's love is a jealous love. And so he will woo Israel and work with Israel and chasten Israel and discipline Israel. His love is not soft and it is not blind. But he is determined to have a people who will be a beautiful people exclusively for his glory. And his love will therefore deal with them all in order to make them utterly his own. Now as we conclude there is one question we need to ask. What should such love as the love of God do for redeemed sinners who are the objects of his love? There are three things it should produce. First, security in our souls. If God's love is unlimited and unmerited and unchanging and inexhaustible, then the love of God should bring us security in our souls. Listen to 1 John, in 1 John chapter 4 from verse 16. So we know and believe the love of God for us. God is love and he who abides in God abides in love. And God abides in him. In this is love perfected for us that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Now how do we have confidence for the day of judgment, beloved? How do you have confidence today for the day of judgment? It has nothing to do with your love for God. It has everything to do with God's love for you. Herein, he says, is the love of God perfected with us that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Here's the second thing. It should give us not only security in our souls, but serenity in our minds. God's love is a perfect love. And in 1 John 4, 18, John says there is no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. And his perfect love means that I am able to trust him and not be afraid Even in hours of great darkness, 
even in hours of sharp sorrow like the sorrow we have been experiencing in recent days, we are able to say, I will trust and not be afraid because his perfect love casts out fear. Security in our souls, serenity in our minds. But thirdly and finally, it is also designed by God to produce a similarity in our character. 1 John 4, 11, Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. The love of God, you see, is not something that God has held far aloft from us. It is something he sheds abroad in our hearts. And do you notice why, John tells us, in 1 John 4, 11, If God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man has ever seen God. Now that's what we were saying to the children. The people in the world where we live have not seen God and do not know God. But listen, if we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. Where will the world find the love of God today? The apostolic answer is when we start loving one another. There is a similarity to the love of God that he means to produce in our characters. Oh, may God fill our hearts with the wonder of such love as his. Now let us sing together as our closing hymn. <clears throat>